Christmas messages over the next number of days, I'm going to focus on the theme of worshiping the King. And I think that when we look at the real significance of Christmas and uh, what it means and the story at the heart of it is worship, the correct response to the story. And I want to read for you this morning from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 18 and onwards. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. And though he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Worship, adoration. That's really the heart of the Christmas story. And I like this uh, painting by Rembrandt entitled The Adoration of the Shepherds. It comes from the golden age of Dutch art. There it is in the 17th century. Rembrandt is developing a style of painting in which light and darkness are the chief features. You can see much light coming from the center of the painting, but right towards the edges, just glimmers of light as Rembrandt is developing what was at the time a radical, revolutionary, new way of painting. But it also gave him the opportunity to explore the theme of Jesus Christ being the light of the world. When you look at the grouping there, you see Mary and Joseph gathered around the infant Jesus. There is a lantern held by somebody towards the right, but most of the light is coming. The source is the Christ child. This was Rembrandt saying, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And something happened. The people who sat in darkness have seen a very great light. So he's saying something very strong and powerful. And you can see just around the group there in the center, there are a small group of shepherds looking in adoration, amazement, and wonder, and worship. But also, behind it, we can see it's very much a very ordinary scene. We have ordinary people, not just the shepherds, but children, families, just an ordinary scene from Rembrandt's interpretation of what took place in that first Christmas story. And what's interesting to me is that this shows perhaps very clearly the heart of the message. Of course, it's about worshiping God and discovering in Christ the light of the world, but it's also that light coming into this world, into the real world. And that's what the Christmas story is all about. In, in many ways, as a story, it has everything you could ever wish for. At the heart of it, you have a teenage pregnancy. That's like uh, very much from our own generation. We have political intrigue. We have conspiracy theories happening. There is romance at the heart of it, and of course, the whiff of a scandal. Then there's the triumph of the common man over all the 
forces of Rome, the military might and despotic rulers of the day. There's a very interesting sci-fi element. Steven Spielberg will be very interested, I'm quite sure. There is this cosmic star which leads the magi to the child. Then there are these extraterrestrial beings, which we would know as angels, God's messengers, uh, proclaiming the birth of Christ. Then there is the, the Dan Brown take, where we have the hidden wisdom discovered in secret ancient texts and dusty documents. But at the heart of it is the story of hope, which is centered around this child. So as a story, it has anything any novelist, anything any person from Hollywood would ever dream of in building up this picture. But for us, of course, it's more than just a story. There are many, many people who will celebrate Christmas, maybe from different faiths and religions and Maybe even atheists participate because for them, the story is interesting and it's nice and um, they can go with it, but it's nothing they really believe is actually true. I want to tell you, if the Christmas story is not true, we have no reason for the season, no, nothing at all to celebrate. How is it that people today can be so interested in religious themes and ideas and yet throw out the bulk of it and say, it's okay Believing is only something that, that makes you feel good, and really, if you want to believe it, that's your private, personal affair, but it has nothing to do with truth, nothing to do with reality, and nothing to do with the real world. Well, if the story is true, it certainly has everything to do with the real world, and just as Christ was born into that first century generation and situation and culture of the day, so he would be equally relevant to the real world of today. Politics, education, economics, because religion and real life belong together. That is, of course, true religion. M most often in our, in our thinking in the Western world, we kind of put religion and faith in one category and real life in another category. So, religion and real life occur at different times and in different places. Sunday mornings in church buildings, it's okay. We can sing and enjoy and, as it were, go with it. But straight afterwards, when we go out into the real world, then it's another matter altogether. But the whole point is, is that Jesus came right into the real world. Not just the world of religion, but also the world of politics, and the world of economics, and the world of education, and the world of all the social structures of his particular day. He came into our world so that we could see him and experience him. In the Old Testament, we read of so many prophets that God sent, and indeed angelic messengers who came proclaiming something. But this time, in the Christ child, God didn't send anybody. He came himself in the person of his son. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 verse 1, John 1 verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word begotten really is badly translated right there. It just means the one and only one, the unique one, the unique son of God. He was never begotten. He, he never came into being. He always was. He is the eternal son of the eternal father. But what is of interest to me is how very carefully John, who writes this, is, is, is taking time to express how real this event was. God becoming man. It says the Word became flesh. And the word flesh here is perhaps the word that most accurately communicates the reality of human existence. We say to ourselves, flesh and blood. And we speak about, he could have talked about human personality. He could have said, well, he became a real human being but he chooses a word that expresses the frailty of, human, of humanity 
and saying he really did become fully human in every way like we are except without sin. And because he became flesh, we were able to see him. In other words, he was manifested. And isn't this the problem? We talk about the real world as if that's all there is. But the real world is only part of the total picture of reality. Beyond what we call the real world is the kingdom of God. And we, when we worship Christ as king, we're acknowledging that there is another do domain, uh, a spiritual realm, the kingdom of God, which, is, which reflects the ultimate reality. So our world is far beyond what we can see and touch. It goes beyond that. Reality goes beyond just the physical, and it takes a visitation from the invisible being made manifested in the visible so that we could see him and hear him and touch him and know him. That's the beauty and marvel of all of this. So the word who was in the beginning with God, that word was made flesh. He was manifested, made visible by becoming a man, and he dwelt among us. That's why we could behold his glory. And so we see that Jesus is God coming into this world with all its history, with all its reality, and becoming part of human history is so relevant to our experience today because that history continues right up until today. Now, of course, it didn't just happen. There is a massive historical background to this. All the Jewish prophets who spoke and prophesied was, were fulfilled when Jesus came. The historical events of the Old Testament building up, preparing the world for the coming of Christ. Indeed, the very historical setting of first century Judea and the Roman Empire. All of that is set up as real history into which Jesus came. And when he came, he was manifested and, and therefore capable of being seen capable of being talked to, capable of being touched. And uh, this is the eyewitness testimony of the Bible. Uh, see, when he came into the real world, he came to show us ultimate reality, not just more about our own world. And the whole of the gospel record depends on historical eyewitness accounts of actual real events. This is not just a story. This is real. Take a look at 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. Here we have the apostolic testimony. We need to understand that these people were in as much need as eviden of evidence as you and I are. You couldn't just go to a first century person and say, hey, God's shown up especially not to any Jewish people, because for them, God was so remote that this, this, uh, this uh, description of God being manifested in the flesh was highly controversial. It was something that they needed to be persuaded about. They needed to be convinced of. Don't think that just because they lived in the first century, they are gullible. And we in the 21st century, we're not so, <laughs> we, we are more cynical. No, no, no. Every human being needs to see and know for themselves. And the apostolic testimony is like, like the eyewitness reporters, the, the, the CNN news reports of the particular day. John 1, 1 John 1 verses 1 to 3, that which was from the beginning, that's this other world, which we have heard with our own eyes, uh, which we've heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, See, John is saying, we saw him. He was visible. We heard him. He is audible. We handled him. He is tangible. This is real. Verse 2, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness. Can you hear what he's saying? He's saying, this is not just a story that's made up. We're telling you what actually happened. 
We were there. We saw it. We heard it. We experienced it. And we're telling you about it. And our testimony is reliable. Can you see how historical the Christian message is? It's not just some ideas that we have. You see, this is the problem. A lot of people say faith is believing something that you think rather than what you know to be true. It's about your personal opinion. And that's why people today don't bother too much about what you believe so long as you believe. And they say, how nice for you. But if Jesus Christ is the king, <laughs> it's not just nice for us. It's essential for us and essential for the whole world. If he is the light of the world without Christ in your life, you are in darkness. But the apostolic witness and testimony is so significant. They say, we have seen this and we bear witness and now we declare to you that life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And so here we have the direct witness of the New Testament, which carries integrity. Not just textual integrity, but the reliability of the witnesses. These people weren't making things up. These weren't legends. This was written down within just decades after the events. So this is real history, not just a make-believe story. And you say, well, that's the Bible. But even outside of the Bible, the historians of the day recognized the reality of this. For example, Tacitus, who was a Roman historian who wrote at the end of the first century, the beginning of the second century, he wrote a history called the Annals of Rome. And in dealing with Nero, who in AD 64 launched a persecution against the, against the church. And, and what he tried to do was blame the Christians for the fire at Rome. And uh, the historian records this. He says, he, that is Nero, falsely charged and punished the persons commonly called Christians. Christus, that's Christ, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. Very historically specific, independent confirmation outside of the Gospels, independent, secular, historical confirmation that Jesus actually lived and he actually died and cor corroborating the story of the New Testament. And of course, Apostle John isn't the only one who is concerned about facts. Luke, who wrote the third Gospel and the book of Acts, is at great pains in the introduction to his gospel, great pains to show that this is not cunningly invented ideas or stories, but it rests on reliable research of eyewitness first-hand accounts. It actually happened. Not just the birth of Jesus, but the whole of the gospel story, the life of Jesus, the witness of Jesus, the works of Jesus, the words of Jesus, the miracles, his death on the cross, and his resurrection actually happened and has been historically recorded. Luke 1, verses 1 to 4. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled amongst us, uh, have been fulfilled amongst us simply means this actually happened. No, no, it really happened. That's what he's saying. Verse 2. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. So these testimonies have been handed down by those who were there, who saw it, who heard it. And Luke has carefully investigated. Verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, what an extraordinary claim. He says, I have been so careful in my research and pulling together of these facts and these details that I have got an accurate account of the story from the very beginning, which includes, of course, the story that we're talking about, the Christmas story. So he says, it seemed good to me also to write to you an orderly account. In other words, to set this in order so that we could follow it logically, 
carefully. And of course, it was all written and published at a time when people themselves could have corroborated or falsified what he had to say. This was not just something made up and hidden in a corner. This was published abroad and people could contradict it. People come and say that you haven't got this right, you haven't got that right. He had to get it right before it went out into the world. And verse four, he says, he's addressing it to Theophilus, this is the person he's dedicating the work to. Verse four, he says, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. That sounds very relevant to today's world. You don't believe everything you hear. You don't even believe everything you see, do you? You've got to check it out over and over again and have it corroborated, especially a story as significant as this in which it is claimed that God has been manifested into this world. And so we could go on and, and maybe develop the whole argument and the presentation of these things so that you could become convinced on evidence alone, not personal experience, but evidence alone that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is God manifested in the flesh. But if you come to that understanding, then something has to change. There has to be a response because this can't be, oh, how nice for you. No, it's not just nice for us. This tells us that God is real, and the Bible says he that comes to God must first believe that he is. So that's a good beginning, isn't it? God is real. He exists, not just in the philosophical mind or in some theoretical presentation. God actually exists. That behind this world that we can see and, and touch and what we live in, behind this is, is God's kingdom that God exists, and, and not only does it exist, but he has come into this world to demonstrate who he is and to bring us into the truth of his kingdom. It also tells us that Jesus Christ reveals who God is. Not just that God exists, but what God is like. This is what Jesus meant when he said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So you don't have to be Struggling in your mind, does God exist? And if, if he exists, what he's like? What kind of God is he? Uh, you know, is he a loving God? Or, or is he a good God? Or is he a bad God? Or, or is he this kind of a God? Or that kind of a God? Or is he many, many kind of gods? You don't have to be struggling over the answers to that question. You have to simply look at Jesus and understand that in Christ is the full and final revelation of who God is. Because it is God himself manifested in the flesh. Now we're talking about something very different from the description of most people when they talk about faith. You see, faith is one kind of a realm. It's just what you think, your opinion, and what you believe to be true, but what you don't necessarily know is true in any way. What's true for you may not be true for me, because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. It does matter. It matters whether our faith is anchored in historical reality. It matters whether Jesus was speaking the truth when he described the kingdom of God in the way that he did. It matters whether the fact of the crucifixion was more than an execution of some troublemaker in ancient times, but whether this was truly the Son of God who was paying the price for the sins of the world. It really does matter whether Jesus is the light of the world as he claimed to be, and as we saw Rembrandt believed him to be, certainly in his pictorial representation of that nativity scene, it really does matter. And if it matters, if it is real, it matters. And if it matters, it matters to the highest extent possible. In other words, this really happened. And God is really real, and our faith is really real, and Christ is real, and the Christmas story is real. The birth of Jesus is real. Everything about it is real. Give Jesus a praise. Amen and amen. So, if, if it is real, what's the purpose? Now, of course, so much of the purpose is already expressed because if the purpose uh, of light is to shine, then this is about revelation. It's about God showing himself. Isn't that always the problem? That See, faith requires belief in the invisible. 
And, and you say, well, now that Christ has come, what role does faith have? You see, you have to acknowledge him and recognize him. It's not just that he came, but that you must go beyond the knowledge that he came. You must recognize him for who he is, and you must respond in a way that is appropriate to what's happening. That's why the adoration of the shepherds and, and this theme about worshiping the king is so important because we're so used to worshiping ourselves, we're so used to worshiping other people, we're so used to worshiping the created things rather than the creator that this is gonna bring a radical reorientation of our lives. And this was the mission of mercy, this great rescue mission that Jesus came to execute. And this form of revelation for me is, is, a, is a reality check. It's a reality check. You know, one of the things that we are dealing with in our society is what we can call secularism. And what that is, is listen, you religious people, you're quite entitled to believe what you want to believe, but privately, quietly, on the side sidelines, and we'll kind of respect your right to hold that opinion, and that's all very well for you, and we'll go along with it to a certain extent, but don't ever, ever expect that to be put in the center stage of our world, of our society. Don't, don't, don't think that. Keep it to the sidelines. Keep it private. Keep it marginalized, because we all really know that this isn't true. This is just fairy, fairy story. You know, it's just, okay, it's all good. Mythology, it's all good. Legend, it's all good, but it's not true. Suddenly, when we approach the Christmas story, recognizing either it is true or it's not true. And if it's not true, it's not worth anything. Amen? Because it's a lie. But if it is true, it's worth everything. Just as Jesus came and lived. Do you notice how Jesus spent the first 30 years of his life before there was any public declaration? Before the Father spoke to, from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son. Before Jesus went to proclaim the kingdom of God, speaking and acting as Messiah, the anointed one, the holy one of God, demonstrating by his creative miracles, by his breathtaking teaching, the stunning demonstration of who God is and, and the public presentation of the reality of God in this world. Before that ever happened, Jesus spent 30 years living a kind of normal life. He was, as we know, that baby in the manger. Then he became the toddler in Galilee. And then the adolescent. And, and then on to that into young adulthood. We know of his family, we know of his profession. He was the son of a carpenter, he took care of the carpenter shop. We have every reason to believe that Joseph, his adoptive father or whatever, because we know God was his father, Joseph had nothing to do with bringing Christ into this world, but he was his father, uh, earthly father figure, uh, uh, and he passed away. Everything we know suggests that Joseph died ahead of Mary. And uh, so Jesus would have had responsibility in the home. And he was working, earning his living, supporting his family. He was a brother to the brothers and sisters that were born to Mary and Joseph after Jesus was born, because he was born uh, when Mary was a virgin, and this was a supernatural work of God's Holy Spirit inside the womb of Mary. But this tells us that Jesus has really come into the heart of life and living on this planet. And so therefore, there is no part of human life and experience that is not relevant in the kingdom of God. Family life, to be a child, the son or a daughter in a home, to be a cousin, to be an uncle. There we have family life, God saying, I want to be at the heart of your family. I want to be at the heart of your family life. I want the whole of your family life to be built around me because I care about family life. I care about children. I care about adolescents. I care about young people. I've been through it myself. Jesus has lived through it all. 
I care about what it means to earn your living. I know what it is like to live as a stranger in an occupied land. So there's political tensions and cultural and social tensions. Jesus experienced every single thing that you and I experienced. And in doing it, he experienced it victoriously. And there's hope for us all. Hallelujah. We know that we don't live 100% sin-free, either before we're saved and even after we've been saved. I've been around long enough to know that. Uh, you think I'm thinking of you. I'm thinking of me. Anyway, all right. So we, we, we know that there is weakness here and failure, but, but Jesus was successful. He successfully pleased God in every part of his life. So this means that the reality of our faith is not to be kept to a certain time and a certain place. 11 o'clock, Kensington Temple, Sunday mornings. Yes, this is exciting. Amen. But beyond this, he is relevant at 1 o'clock on Sunday and at 3 o'clock on Monday. He is relevant every day of the week because something has happened that has taught us to redefine how we live, who we live for, and at the heart of it is this worshipful recognition of who Jesus is, that he actually came. He is real and relevant to the whole of life. And this is one of the things that we stress here in Kensington Temple, almost above everything else, certainly it's the point of almost everything we do. Your job is to recognize Jesus to such an extent that you reflect him every day of your life. And you walk with God and live in the kingdom. And don't let people marginalize either you for being a Christian or the faith that you profess. And you can stand up. You can stand up to people. You don't have to ever have to back down. People say, oh, that's what you believe. I was speaking recently to somebody and, and they were telling me about what they believed and I was very interested. There's no doubt about it. Very interested in their religious viewpoint. Very interested in their religious experience in Buddhism. Very interested in how they worked it out in their daily life. Very interested to see of the benefits that they were able to share about their own life and their own experience and all of that. Highly interesting. And normally at this point in the conversation, what you're supposed to do in today's world is say, how nice for you. Now let me share you with you my perspective. And then you share your opinion and they share their opinion. And you might bring other people into the discussion until you have as many opinions as there are in the people in the room and sometimes 10 times more opinions than there are people in the room. And it's all a world, world realm of opinion. But in the middle of all of this discussion, I said, now, how do you know that what you believe is actually true? How do you know that? And does it matter? Does it matter whether it's true or not? If you're experiencing it and enjoying it, does it really matter whether it's true or not? In today's world and philosophy, no. It doesn't really matter whether something's true. It's just how much good is it doing in your life? How much you're, you're blessed by it, to use our charismatic language. If it blesses you, it's great. I'll tell you, that's just like the world who says, if it feels good, it is good. The truth is, we know that it's more important than that. I said, the answer was, well, I, I'm not exactly saying that. I don't really know. So I said, you are staking the whole of your existence and eternity on something that you are not even sure whether it is true or not. And you can't give me any reason to demonstrate why it is true. Let me tell you the difference between what you believe and the Christian gospel. The Christian gospel is not a matter of mere human opinion. It's not something that has been invented, some nice ideas that make people feel good. It is the truth of God manifested in the flesh. And when he came, he came for some very, very good reasons. Chief of all, of course, was not only to show who God is, to demonstrate the kingdom and invite people to join in the kingdom. But ultimately, he was born to carry 
our sins on the cross so that we could become right with God. And God gave evidence that all that had taken place when God raised him from the dead. Come, let us worship the king. How does it begin? It begins by having real faith. Real faith. Not just belief in something, but real faith, recognizing that what you believe is not a matter of opinion. It's fact. Now, you have to come to that decision and conclusion. And even if you did, say, suppose I was able to go, would you look at all the references, the historical textbooks and everything, and build everything up point by point, case by case, so you were able to say, yes, I am intellectually persuaded. I am convinced that your arguments are sound, that this is reasonable, it makes sense of the best sense of all the facts and evidences that we can have, and... Uh, uh, and I actually, actually believe, yes, God was manifested in the flesh. All right, that would be a very good beginning. Do you agree? But it's not enough. Because faith is not just an intellectual exercise in which we can become rationally persuaded that something has taken place. The facts have greater significance than that. It's about your eternal destiny. It's about hope for your own soul and for your own life. And so you need to move just from the recognition that God is and recognize that in Christ you can come to know him. And so you exercise faith. And this faith that we speak of is not totally unrelated to reason and to experience and to facts that we've been speaking about, but it is something deeper because it's putting your trust in those very facts. One of the stories that preachers often tell, and I think it's a true story, but the illustration is worth it anyway because it, it, it shows a picture of London, the uh, tightrope walker, apparently strung, tightrope across Niagara Falls, and he walked up and down in that, and it was really good, he did, did it well, then he wheeled a wheelbarrow across, and then they, he said, how many people believe that I could wheel them from this side of Niagara Falls to the other side? Everybody had seen that he'd just done it, so they said, yes, we believe that you could do that. So he said, who will be the first to get into the wheelbarrow? And, and of course, nobody was willing, because it's one thing to believe that he can do it. It's another thing to trust him to do it to you. And this is the difference between just knowing about Jesus, even if you are convinced that these are facts. And it's important whether they are facts, whether they are true or not true. Even if you were convinced, you still need to come like those humble shepherds and adore him. And that begins by the exercise of real faith. I want to close just by taking two cameo shots of, from the Christmas story of two characters to illustrate this. I'm going to take you first to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, verses 18 through to 20. And I'm sure you know the story. Zacharias was on deacon duty in the Jewish temple. What that meant was that he was on duty to show up and, and get involved in certain of the apparatus and preparation for the functioning of the temple. And as he was about his business, an angel appeared to him and said, you're going to have a child. And prophesying the uh, pregnancy, the conception of John the Baptist and Elizabeth, his mother, being becoming pregnant. And... Um, this is, this is the response, Luke 1, verse 18. And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man. And if you think I'm old, my wife is well old. Well, as a slight paraphrase. <laughs> my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I... I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. Can you hear what he's saying? He's saying, you don't get it, do you? 
I am Gabriel, archangel. I stand in the very presence of God, and God sent me to tell you this good news. And all you can say is, how do I know? <laughs> so, Gabriel then says, you want to know how you will know? I'll tell you how you will know. Verse 20, but behold, you will be mute, struck dumb. You will not be able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. Now, it sounds like Gabriel is mad with him and um, is cursing him and saying, I'll, I'll teach you a lesson. You know, if you can't speak words of faith, then you won't let you say anything at all. And I guess there can be a judgment element here. I guess that. But he is answering Zacharias's question. How will I know? This is how you will know. I'm going to give you a sign. I'm not going to let you go around spreading your unbelief. Zip it up. You will not be able to speak until it is fulfilled, and then you will know that this has come from God. So there is mercy here. There is real mercy here. But the response that I want to focus on was that Zechariah did not believe. I don't know whether they got out of the wrong side of the bed that morning, whether they had too many mince pies the night before. I don't know. I don't know whether his auntie had given him yet another knitted woolen jumper that he'd rather have done without. I don't know why, if he was just in a bad mood. I don't know whether he felt particularly weak and frail. I don't know whether he had long since given up hope of ever fathering a child. Now he is beyond it. He's past it. And if he doesn't think he's past it, he takes one look at his wife and says, well, she's definitely past it. There's no way this is going to happen. But out of the impossibility of human frailty and human limitations, God sends an angel to speak a miracle into existence. And that gives me hope today. Whatever situation you find yourself in, it might be such an impossible situation that you're sitting here saying, well, it could never happen to me. Watch out, because it could happen to you. If God speaks it, it's settled in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. But what I like is the logic of Gabriel. He says, I'm, I stand in the very presence of God. Would I lie to you? How could I lie to you? I'm telling you the truth. God's in it. God's going to do it, Gabriel says. And the right response is to have real faith. Wow. I take it. Amen. Real faith. No, oh, that's a nice story. Oh, guess what happened to me today? I met an angel. You did? Well, how do you know it was an angel? I don't know, but it sounds good, doesn't it? No. It doesn't matter if you believe me, I don't believe. Anyway, that's it. It's not anything to be trifled with. If this is reality, if there really is a God and in His presence are the angels and He sends occasionally His angels to deliver a message of intervention into the earth realm so the kingdom of God can come and people can receive Christ and be saved and come into the kingdom of God and become true worshippers of the one true in the living God. If any of that makes any sense at all, then it has to be a response of real faith. No, no, I just accept it. No, no, don't just accept it. Do you really, really believe it? Because if you really, really believe it, something is going to happen to you that will change the rest of your life. And not just you in your own individual way, but it will have an impact on those around you. This won't just be a faith on Sunday that we do something in a different place and a different time from what we do for the rest of the week. No, this will permeate every aspect, every moment, every microsecond of every day because it's that real and it's that true. Okay, we started with him and that he gives us hope because, you see, <laughs> even Zacharias, you see, you think he's a Bible character, 
And therefore, he'll just be an automatic believer. No, there's no such thing as an automatic believer. It takes the gift of God. It takes a miracle to open up our hearts because as human beings, we're so resistant to understanding the reality and the truth of God. But when we accept him and when we see it and we really believe it, what a difference it makes. Now, the next person is Mary herself. Luke chapter 1, verse 38 Mary herself. Now, you will know the story. Same angel visiting this young, teenaged young woman and saying to her that she is going to be the human vehicle through which the Christ was to come into the world. And not just that she would give birth to a great heroic leader, somebody who would rise up as a, a leader, uh, 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 maybe a, bring a revolution or to bring some kind of restoration to the sanity of Israel, to somehow throw off the Roman yoke so that we'd have a great political leader, a Nelson Mandela type figure. No, a greater than he. He shall be called the Son of the Most High God. You will give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That which is in you shall become great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, the Most High God. This is God manifested in the flesh. Now I ask you, which is harder to believe? An old man and old woman are going to have a baby? Or this virgin young maiden is going to bring God into the world? I'll tell you, the thought or knowledge that God was coming to the world through this lady's womb, beginning by the, with this tiny impregnation, deep in the midst of her womb, created by the Holy Spirit, God becoming man. That is, that takes greater faith. But she had it. Her question was, how can this be? She hadn't understood. She said, I'm a virgin. I've not known a man, and even right now I don't know a man. She was betrothed to Joseph. And in the Jewish system of the day, first there was a betrothal, which was where the marriage vows were exchanged. Then there was a period of time in which the bride and the groom, the husband and wife, lived separately until the coming together in their marriage, and that's when it was consummated. They were truly married at betrothal. That's why the issue was about divorce at that time. You remember, Joseph was thinking of divorcing her. It had to be a divorce because they were legally, covenantally married, but they had not been physically joined. And during this time, there's no hanky-panky, okay? Even after the vow, can you imagine that you think it's hard today? So at least, at least when you've made your exchange your vows, you can get on with it. But uh, up until then, no. But even then, you make your vows, and so you're committed, and there's still nothing. Anyway, let's not go there. So, <laughs> so it was a serious situation. And she just didn't understand, how's this going to be? And he said, look, I'm not talking about natural procreation. I'm not talking about you and Joseph having a child. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit working in you a supernatural conception which will be God manifested in the flesh. Now that is even, I mean, you know, sometimes the explanation raises more questions. And I know scholars and philosophers and theologians have been struggling about that ever since. How does that work? Don't tell me you have to kiss your brains goodbye the day you become a Christian. The Bible teaching and the gospel story gives you enough stuff to reflect on for eternity to stretch the tiny little gray cells that we falsely call our human brains. No, she was satisfied. Her question had been ans answered. How, how can it be? So verse 38 how does she respond? Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. What's that? That's faith. Real faith. If God has said it, 
That settles it. If God has said it, then it will be according to his word. That's what faith is. Faith is believing God's word. She didn't ask for a sign. Show me. How will I know? No. You explain how it's going to happen. And I receive. I accept it. And that was real faith. And today I call you, even as a believer, to real faith. If you're not yet a believer, then do it now. Put your faith and trust in Christ. Going back to that former illustration, get in the wheelbarrow and say, yeah, I will trust this. I will, I will go with this. I believe it, and I'll commit my life to it. But even if you have faith, make sure that faith is real. In other words, you know that this is not just, as our society tells us, a matter of human opinion. This is not just the Christian view. This is the light of the world, God manifested in the flesh. And if that's the case, suddenly everything changes. Not only our own life, not just how we worship and the carols we sing and the songs we sing. It's how we live day by day at home, in the family, in the workplace, in the place of education, where, and how we influence our society, how we witness for Christ, how we demonstrate the reality of our faith by what we do so that people will see Christ in us and begin to say, yes, there's something in this. I've seen Christ. I've seen him. I've seen him in you. I've seen him in you. I've seen him in you. And then, most important of all, we will not keep our faith and our religion private, just to the sidelines. No, it will cause us to express him in everything we say and everything we do. And when we fail, and we will, as frail human beings, we go back to the one who never failed and thank him for his love and his atonement, his sacrificial death on the cross For he who was born, was born to live and to die, that we might find life in him. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to underline the reality of these things. We know at times, Lord, these great truths are easily rehearsed glibly spoken of, but we thank you that your word goes deeper than glib words, but they are glued to the depth of our heart and experience. And I pray, Father, for a renewing of faith, real faith, so that somehow, we can begin to shake off the secular yoke and demonstrate to the real world that we are in Christ and his kingdom has come and that Jesus is Lord of the whole of life. We say, Father, we believe and Father, we receive. In Jesus' name, Amen and amen. Give Jesus a big praise. God bless you.